thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been a, a, a I followed your work for a long time, and I've been very impressed by your books. You're the author of two books, Mad in America and Anatomy of an Epidemic. You've been investigating the, the dangers of long-term use of psychiatric drugs for decades. Um, I think you were also nominated for a Pulitzer Prize at one point for your, for your work. Yeah, I was actually a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize, one of three finalists. Ah. Great. So you were easy, a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. It's pretty easy to get nominated, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. So I've also looked into this quite a bit myself for a potential documentary for the BBC a few years ago um, and looked at your work. Um, would you like to just start off by summarizing your work um, for people who maybe aren't familiar with it uh, for, as a I very think, big picture? Yeah, no, I think the big picture is this. You know, starting in 1980, which is when the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual was published by the American Psychiatric Association, starting in the United States, but then it expanded. We got a narrative that was told to the public and our societies organized themselves around the narrative, which we were told was scientific. And the narrative is, is, is quite simple, is that they, had dis they were discovering that these are brain diseases, these are brain illnesses, depression, anxiety, psychosis. And most important, that it seemed that they were due to chemical imbalances in the brain and that the drugs we had fixed those chemical imbalances like insulin for diabetes. That's the story we were sold. It's a story of great scientific progress when you think about it, right? Think about how complex the brain is, the human brain, and they had identified the very molecule that causes madness, depression, anxiety, and they could fix it. If, if that's so, I'd say that's the greatest discovery in may, maybe scientific history, given the complexity of the brain. And then we heard, you know, then we got stories about these new drugs that were so much better than the first generation psychiatric drugs. Prozac, of course, was the first, but we got new antipsychotics, et cetera. And with that narrative, our use of, well, first of all, diagnoses expanded, but our use of psychiatric drugs just expanded. First in the United States, and by the way, to people of all ages. I mean, we started medicating our kids to our elderly people. And initially, there was some resistance in Europe to medicating the kids. And, but gradually, <laughs> this story took hold really around the world. Now, my work, I think, it, it, it writ large is this, is to say, is it true? <laughs> it does, and by the way, not from the critics, does their own scientific literature um, support that story? So, and what you find is that the chemical imbalance theory was always a hypothesis. So for example, we've heard that depression is due to um, too little serotonin and the drugs up serotonin, okay? Well, you can go back and you can see that hypothesis really arises in the 1960s. And you can see by 1984, the NIMH is saying, listen, we're just not finding that people who are depressed have low serotonin. And then in 1998, the American Psychiatric Association's own textbook says, you know, the chemical imbalance theory was a pretty um, naive theory in the first place. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, there was really no reason that the cause of a problem should be the opposite of the drug's mechanism of action. And they said, it, it's gone. It didn't, we didn't confirm it. And you can go, Kenneth Kendler in 2004, he was a world leader in investigating this. Says, hey, we've hunted for these chemical imbalances and we haven't found them. That's what's in the scientific literature, but that's not what was being told to the public. And that includes by the American Psychiatric Association. Now that's the first part. You can, and so you see this, this narrative of progress starts to fall apart. So the irony, the real irony of the whole chemical imbalance story is this in scientific terms. A, the whole theory arose because of an understanding of how the drugs acted on the brain, how they perturbed normal functioning, okay? And what they found is that before people went on the drugs, they didn't have any characteristic chemical imbalance. But they found that once you go on these drugs, they induce a, a physiological change, opposite of the drug's mechanism of action, that is the very thing that was hypothesized to cause, say, psychosis or uh, depression in the first place. That's what their science showed. And what is so amazing is you see this worry going uh, all the way back to the 70s. 
And the worry that antidepressants actually were depressogenic agents uh, over the long term, that you can trace that back to the 80s, but especially then in the 90s. So that's a very long-winded answer, David, to say that in simple terms, we as a society have organized ourselves around this narrative of scientific progress. Now, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist, right? I didn't, I didn't do the research. But you can go and look at that research and you find that the scientific story is quite different, okay? And unfortunately, what you find over the long term again and again is that uh, we are worsening the natural course of these disorders over the long term in the aggregate. So we're talking now specifically because of the news about Jordan Peterson and he just put out a video yesterday um, talking about his history with benzodiazepines and warning people not to take them for more than two weeks, that this is, that he's very worried about those drugs. Can you talk specifically about benzodiazepines in this context? What, how, how do they work and how does the brain kind of compensate? Why is it so dangerous to be taking them for, for a length of time? Yeah, uh, the benzo story is really amazing because uh, doctors have known these drugs for a long time, shouldn't be taken longer than two or three weeks. So that's not even new knowledge. That became like the official recommendation in 1980. Uh, here's, here's the thing. So when we talk about serotonin and dopamine, they're, they're, they're basically excitatory neurons, uh, excitatory um, neurotransmitters. What does that mean? You have a presynaptic neuron, right? And it releases, and let's say it's a dopaminergic neuron. It releases that dopamine. It binds with receptors on the, uh, so this is the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron. And since it's an excitatory neuron, it causes this neuron to fire, okay? And that's how messages are passed along. But the brain, at the same, think of a car, has an accelerator, it also has a brake, right? And, and that's how you sort of maintain brain function because you have molecules that can excite things or then you have molecules that can quiet things. Well, the molecule that quiets things, the main molecule is called GABA. And so what happens is that, with a, with a GABA neurotransmitter, it, it, it inhibits the firing of the second neuron. It makes it less likely to fire. So it's a quieting thing. So what a benzodiazepine does is it amps up the GABA system. It's like slamming the brake on, 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 on neuronal activity. So that's why, you, 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 you know, that's why, um, you know, your emotions you know, you feel relaxed or you don't care, your anxiety goes. It's because the, the, the benzo, when you first take it, is quieting your, 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 your brain, in essence, and your whole system. And this is why also, if you don't take too many benzos, you'll stop breathing, right? Um, so what, what is, again, so what happens? So this is your braking system, right? So you go on a benzo, uh, and the benzo is amplifying GABA. It, it, it gets into the GABA receptor, so it acts as a GABA substitute. So your brain goes, ah, oh, I'm, I'm doing too much inhibit, inhibition. There's too much inhibitory of, of, of my regular functioning. So it starts reducing its uh, GABA receptors and its own production of GABA. So think about this. It's the normal break, right? Now, what you do is with the drug, you press harder on that brake, all right? It's like you're putting your foot down, but the brain, brain's own braking mechanism then starts becoming less effective, okay? So now go off your benzo, right? What do you got? You've lost your braking system or it's become diminished. So that's why, for example, you hear people coming off, oh, I've got these weird skin sensations and all these things. It's because your neurons are firing like crazy out of control because you have, you have at the very least, lessened that natural braking system. Now, the other thing that people don't realize, so I take a benzo for four weeks. Now, I can either go off, I can keep on. Many people keep on. Well, the best... Uh, the best long-term studies we have show that over the long-term, even if you stay on your uh, benzo, you're more likely to become ang anxious, okay? It's like the drug because of this whole change in your brain system, it starts losing its effectiveness. And so even if you stay on, you'll see uh, 
if you do comparison between a group that never took it and, and one that stayed on, you'll see that the, the group continually on will have more anxiety, more panic episodes, more likely to be start, you know, agoraphobia, you know, all these things that we associate with it. So long, long, to summarize all this, there's some evidence you can use these drugs for two weeks with some effectiveness and particularly in difficult times. But beyond that, you're getting into a place where it's quite clear uh, that you're setting yourself up for difficult times, uh, trouble getting off. And if you stay on, um, more emotional problems. And by the way, cognitive uh, impairments too. Yeah, I, I remember reading your, your work and it just seems so clear that because the brain is a, an adaptive system, it's adapting to these per perturbations that you're having from the from not just benzos but all all psychiatric drugs and then especially if you're taking it for anxiety and your brain is then effectively kind of um ramping up the the receptors for anxiety when you're coming off them you are then super super sensitized for the very thing that you were trying to uh, dull down in the first place one thing i'd like to ask you about because I've seen Jordan uh, Peterson and his daughter talk about that he was prescribed it for a food allergy and then increasingly over, over time developed what he described as a very unusual reaction to, to benzos where they were actually making him more anxious rather than less. And from what I understand from your work at least, that's not actually that unusual to that you once over time you start to actually become become more and more sensitized to the very thing that you're trying to block. What would you, how would you reflect on that? No, I think you just got it right. <laughs> no, I, I mean, this is part of the tragedy of this whole thing, that you come there for some short relief and short-term relief, uh, but you're setting yourself up if you stay on these very long for, uh, for a difficult process, either the difficult thing of coming off, or just as you said, because the brain has changed, um, more everyday anxiety. And there, there is a, a mechanism that explains it. And the mechanism that you're, is, is you're taking away the brain's own braking system, physiologically. And I don't know if we understand it. So the brain's trying to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium, right? It's trying to put its break. It. So you go on a benzo. As to your braking system, it's like you're pressing down harder on the braking system and so, the braking system itself sort of dims its own force. And you think that's, a, that's an equilibrium. So maybe if I just stay on the drug, this will be a new way for the brain to act. But it seems like the brain's, that compensatory system actually becomes a bit dysfunctional as much as anything. So it's not that you really reach a new equilibrium, but as opposed to a sort of, you know, New a new way of, you know, like one foot on the brake, one foot on the accelerator. And it, it seems like it leads over time to sort of a dysfunctionality. So you see like often more psychotic symptoms in psychotic patients on antipsychotics long-term. And that's thought because that the, the brain is becoming so super sensitive to dopamine that it's, it's now in this abnormal state. With depression, the idea is it, it drives your brain into this look, actually a, a very sort of dysfunctional serotonergic state. So benzo, if you continually take it, it seems like it's probably driving your GABA system, which is your braking system, into a, a, a dysfunctional state. I mean, in other words, there's this immediate effort for the brain to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium, but it seems that it's such a stressor on the brain it becomes to become, it tends to become less functional over time. And I, I think this metaphor can maybe illuminate this in a little way. So you get in your car, okay? So, so go ahead and get in your car, foot, put, start to drive, put one foot on the accelerator, okay? And now as you start driving, put your other foot on the brake, and this is how you decide to go down the, the road, okay? You, you're using both systems. And now drive your car like that for 10 years. Is it going to be, is it going to be very effective, functional? You know, systems wear out is what I'm trying to say. 
if that makes sense. I, I think that's a metaphor to explain how over time you're getting these, this, this, these signs of dysfunction. Yeah, and I've, you've already kind of hinted at it, but I'd like to broaden this out a little bit. Um, why I think this is such a vitally important conversation is sort of the wider issue of iatrogenic damage, which is the word that means damage caused by medical interventions. And I've heard a few people, contacts of mine, talk about the iatrogenic plague. What I understand is that when people often go onto a psychiatric drug and they then have these side effects, it's then often attributed to the condition that they originally presented with, but they are often then in this kind of system of a different cocktail of drugs moving from one to the other, and they all have quite, they can all collectively have quite damaging effects. Can you talk about that sort of catch-22 situation that people find themselves in and how that plays out, just in a sort of a bigger picture? Well, in a way, I think you've summarized it quite good. It's <laughs> quite well. Um, that's exactly right. So what happens is, uh, so you, you start down this path, okay? And often you, you get down this path with just a mild problem, right? You come in, you have a mild problem, you're looking for, maybe you got divorced or you lost a job or something has happened, okay? Maybe you're not sleeping. And so you start down this path where your brain is gonna be changed by the drug. And as we were discussing earlier, very often it poops out. The positive effect, the sort of control of the symptoms, poops out over time, right? So what happens when it poops out? Do you blame, and, and, and maybe new symptoms are coming up, right? Oh, I wasn't depressed before, but now I'm depressed. Right? I wasn't anxious before, now I'm anxious. The proper medical thing would be to say, ah, the drug has stopped working, and maybe it's in, indeed inducing those problems. That's the iatrogenic damage. But people who prescribe drugs don't want to admit that their drugs are doing harm. They only want to see them through a prism of doing help. Even though we all know that drugs can do harm, that's not how the prescriber or the, um, you know, the medical profession of psychiatry wants to see its drugs. So what they do is, is they start saying that um, uh, people are treatment resistant or, you know, it's the illness that is, is what you're seeing now is the illness return. And once that happens, what happens? You go on a second drug, you go on a third drug, you go on a fourth drug. Now, if you start on one and end up on four drugs, uh, that's a sign of medical failure, right? I mean, you, you, no one says polypharmacy is good. And what it means is you've, you've started having new symptoms. And so you're moving to new symptoms, new dysfunction. And once you get on four or five drugs, boy, I mean, it's hard to function well on four or five drugs. And you can't imagine the number of the stories that, I mean, you can, but there's so many stories like, I went on, just the other night, I met, a, I, I, was in, I was talking to someone who, in their sophomore year of college, um, they broke up with a girlfriend and as a result, failed chemistry. <laughs> so he was put on a benzo was anxious. 32 years later, he was trying to taper from the mental. He wasn't working. He'd been on any, any number of drugs. It all started when he broke up with his girlfriend, like when he was 20 years old. But <clears throat> that's part of the um, narrative that really is a, uh, misleads the public with that when people, when you see people deteriorate on these medications long-term, it's blamed to the disease, even though there's no evidence that this is the natural course of things. And in that way, they, they, preserve, they preserve the image of the drugs as, 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 you know, as helpful and all the problems get assigned to the disease, but there's no evidence for that. And, 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 and David, one thing I think that's really important here, what's the natural course of these problems? Because in order to assess whether a drug is doing harm over the long term, okay, or providing a benefit, you have to know the natural course. What is the natural capacity to recover? And so what is the long-term course? Your drug, in order to be beneficial, has to beat that natural recovery rate. So let's say the natural recovery rate from depression is 80%, which by the way is what it used to be called. And, and, and that two years later, let's say, 80% are not depressed, okay? For your drug to be beneficial over two years, you have to have a recovery rate of like 85%. 
and but you don't see that. You'll see like, well, actually, the recovery rate on antidepressants is terrible. But in the best long, in a in a couple long term studies we had in the United States, you know what stay well rate was at the end of one year in real clinical settings. In one, it was three percent, and and the other was about uh, I think it was about six percent. And as the the researchers said, these are astonishingly low. Uh, you know, stay well rates. And when they did those studies, they said, these are real world studies. We're not going to be doing these pharma funded studies where you're, you're trying to pick a select group of people. Now, at the same time, but anyway, so what are you doing? You're taking the natural recovery rate and you're lowering it. Anyway, that's the way to think about this. It's not that everybody does poorly on their drugs, but what are you doing to outcomes in the aggregate? And the the optimistic part of this whole story is, if we go back, is recovery rates in the natural world from an episode of depression, an episode of anxiety. Anxiety in particular was seen as transient, um, or even psychosis. We're, we're so often seen as episodic. You'll get through it. And when we talk about depression as episodic, we're talking about people who got hospitalized for depression. We're not talking about just walking around depression hospitalized depression, clinical depression, and even hospitalized patients, about 80% would be well within one year. And they, they did a modern study on this, and they said, well, what's the recovery rate for depression in modern times? Okay, and they finally did this in the absence of drugs. You know what the recovery rate was at the end of one year? 85%. So in the medicated arm, it was like 10% in the, in the, uh, in the, unmedicated arm, it was like 85%. And if you read that study, the researchers go, wow, oh, it'd really be hard for a drug uh, to beat this recovery rate. Yeah, I just wonder if you could summarize quite briefly, just what you think are the most damning statistics or the most kind of compelling evidence for the damage that's being done of, of, the, of these drugs? Well, in Anatomy of an Epidemic, what I did is I just looked as a marker of disability, okay? So I looked at the number of people who were ending up on government disability due to mental illness, okay? Now that's the extreme end, right? And they can no longer work. Well, in 1987, we had about 1.25 million adults on disability due to mental illness, okay? And we get this, that's when Prozac comes to market, we get this explosion in the use of drugs. And now today it's around 5 million. Uh, adults on disability in the United States. And by the way, it's gone up in every country I can find that embrace this story and the use of antidepressants and all. Uh, like in the UK, um, nor, you know, in, in the Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand, you see it over and over again. The second thing is like, what's happening to the kids? So you see with this increasing use of psychiatric drugs, the mental health of kids is, is, is deteriorating. In the United States, something like, well, first of all, just on disability. In 1987, when Prozac came to market, we had 16,000 kids whose families or guardians received a, a payment because the, kid was the child was disabled by mental illness. It's something like seven or 800,000 now. So, you know, that's like, a, what is that, a 40 time increase, a 40 fold increase? And if you look at kids who end up psychiatrized and sort of, um, uh, you know, if they end up on disability, two thirds go on to uh, adult disability when they turn age 18. But the most amazing thing is something like 50% of American students now uh, seek uh, mental health during their four years of college. So, I see this disability like the canary in the coal, gold, coal mine. In other words, that's, that's a marker of harm done. But all the markers, suicide's gone up like 20 years in a row in the United States. Um, the burden of depression globally has increased dramatically. And I'm not saying it's only due to the drugs. But all the markers of psychiatric distress in developed societies have basically gone up in the last uh, 30 years. So that's on just, um, if we just see this as a, um, a story of a medical failure, okay? If we just look at this through a medical lens, the larger failure is, this is also a story of philosophy because 
think about what the chemical imbalance story is telling you. It's, it's sort of telling you that these chemicals in your brain control you, right? That you're sort of the, the, the robot to these master chemicals. And it takes away a sense of, of responsibility for oneself, right? Because it's not your responsibility that you're unhappy or whatever. Um, whereas if you have a different philosophy and the, and the philosophy is, listen, to suffer is to be human. <laughs> We're gonna be anxious. We're going to be depressed sometimes. And even to go a bit mad is not all that unusual, especially if you stop sleeping and stuff. But if we have like an older style of that, first of all, we have a, you know, if we look at as a philosophy you see in novels and Shakespeare and all, we understand that humans suffer. We also understand that the human mind is not a pleasant place sometimes. It's a difficult place. That becomes your philosophy of understanding what it means to be human. It ain't easy. Growing up ain't easy. So when you suffer, you're depressed, you're grieving, okay, and you're a bit crazy, that's what humans are. At the same time, we understand, in that philosophy, we understand we're responsive to our environment, that maybe you need to change your environment, right? And that's at a, a, an individual level. How about a social level? How do you have a healthy population? Well, we know you try to create a more equal society, a fairer society. You try to make sure people have good housing, healthcare, that sort of thing. So the biggest tragedy in my view is this. We as a society, and this happened in societies around the world, were told a false story. Now it was pitched to us as a story of science. And we organized our thinking, our sense of self, our expectations of our children around that false, around that story. And yet, when you dig into that story, you find it's best understood as a, a marketing story, a commercial story. It's a commercial story. It's serving financial interests, the sort of um, power interests, the prestige of a medical specialty. But it's doing extraordinary harm to society. It's it's we have more people becoming disabled. We have so many people feel that they, they never live their full lives because their emotions were muted. And the biggest thing for me is this sense of philosophy because it, it robs us of our sense that we can be resilient human beings. And also, look at Shakespeare. <laughs> look at your Bible. Humans, you know, we're very emotional creatures. And, and I just think it gives us a false philosophy as well. And that's a huge tragedy, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. I mean, for me, it's part of the sort of the crisis of reductive scientific materialism. Like yeah. we're constantly kind of reducing everything down to, uh, and if you read, and, and also the, the realization that we're so much more complex. Like, it's sort of a reductionistic idea of the psyche as well. Oh, absolutely. By, re <laughs> by reducing the psyche to kind of like measurable, bits and pieces we're just we've we're kind of eviscerating the idea of being human and this is one of the one of the consequences of that kind of worldview i'd love to go into that into that more but i um maybe maybe towards the end because a couple of things i'd like to to just move the conversation on to the question of the media and the incentive structures and why is this story not being told i, I remember reading your book and uh, looking at other books and, and this topic as well, and just feeling incredibly um, angry at, at the level of like the level of harm that is caused by this, and just the, the level of silence that seems to be um, on on the part of 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 the media and on the part of kind of the 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 institutions. How is that maintained? How is that kind of this this story maintained? It's a really good question. <laughs> And uh, it seems hard to imagine that it could have been maintained as well as it has. There's a couple things. The media doesn't really know the science, right? Because you really have to dig into this. You have to understand how, a science, how, how drugs are tested, and how you can uh, bias uh, trials by design, you know. And there's a lot of different ways. You also have to read the whole studies. You don't just read the abstract. So, First problem is even science reporters generally uh, don't know this literature, not really, okay? What they know is what the people they interview tell them. 
know, which are academic psychiatrists and all. Um, so why don't we know this story? One is because American psychiatry basically closed ranks in the early 1980s and said, this is the story we're gonna tell. And they even had uh, training workshops where they taught psychiatrists to, to tell this story. And the idea was psychiatry in the 70s was sort of a discipline in disrepute or fearing for its survival. And if they put on the white coat, both literally and metaphorically or figuratively, they could now present themselves to, it's sort of the image of infectious disease doctors. And remember how uh, celebrated infectious disease doctors are because we, you know, we minimized the infectious disease with the arrival of the antibiotics and all. Anyway, they decided, and you can, you can really see this, psychiatry decided to tell a story in 1980. These are brain illnesses, therefore we're real doctors, our drugs are good. And really, we, if these are illnesses, it doesn't really help to say that talk therapy is good, right? They're medical illnesses, and what do you do with medical illnesses? You, you have a drug, and who can prescribe drugs? It's psychiatrists. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, who really loved this story? Pharmaceutical companies, because now you're gonna take all these ills that human beings, that you can't, get a, you can't pass a drug for unhappiness, okay? But you can pass a drug for a medical condition called anxiety or depression, so they were gonna take all these ills that human beings suffer all the time, just, you know, beyond the asylum, and now they're gonna make them diseases and that's gonna open up the market. So what happened? You see that the pharmaceutical companies start paying academic psychiatrists to be their advisors, consultants, um, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, speakers, advisors, consultants. Now, and I'm talking about a lot of money. So what did the pharmaceutical thing, companies think they were doing when they, were hiring these academic psychiatrists. They thought they were building markets. <laughs> In other words, what did the academic psychiatrists start thinking? I'm so brilliant. <laughs> I'm a world expert that I deserve $500,000 for going on a speaking tour or doing this research or consulting. And you know the old thing, it's hard to convince a man of anything <laughs> or a person of anything if it goes against their financial well-being. The, the actual sentiment is much more concise than that. Um, once the profession said to themselves, this is the story we're going to tell, they're going to start believing that story. And they're, and, and, and they're going to start seeing whatever bits of science that can support that story, that's what they're going to glom onto. And they're going to find a way to either ignore or discount or even keep out of their journals some of the um, stuff that challenge that. And what you see quite clearly in American psychiatric history, those psychiatrists who broke with that and wanted to publish other types of research, they got killed. By killed, I mean their, their, their careers uh, went down the tubes. So that became a clear message that we are going from psychiatry, supported by uh, pharmaceutical money, we're going to tell this story. And okay, so we're committed to this story and we're going to believe it after a while. That's, a, that's the first part of this meeting. The second part is they came up with a great strategy in the, basically in the late 80s, early 90s to discredit the critics. Because unfortunately, one very visible critic was Scientology. You know, they started CCHR. And Scientology is clearly a cult, right? So what happened was whenever critics came forward, and you can even see this in documents, there's a, there's a planning. How do we like, so in the early 19s, 90s, there was a worry that antidepressants increased the risk of suicide, okay? And, and uh, Eli Lilly held a meeting. Well, what are we going to say? And he said, ah, say this is coming from the Scientologists. Because once that is then presented to the media, now I'm a science reporter. I got Scientologists supposedly over here criticizing the drugs. And I have people at Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Stanford telling me a different story. Now, who am I going to believe? Not only am I, who am I going to believe? I don't want anything to do being tainted with that Scientology brush. And they would throw it at anybody, basically, that, you know, stood up and, and criticized. So it was a brilliant public relations thing. Say that people, you know, and they would say, oh, these people criticizing it, they're flat earthers. So they, they managed, as part of the narrative that became the organizing narrative is 
critics of psychiatry, critics of these drugs are flat earthers, they're non-scientific people, they're members of a cult. Now, once that was in place, now it's, it's, it's diminishing, but that was in place in the 1990s and early 2000s when this narrative really took hold. Now I'm an editor and I say, David, go out and do a story. I don't wanna come back and hear that like, uh, these drugs don't, you know, maybe they're increasing suicide or, um, you know, they don't work over the long term. And then I'm going to say, you're the reporter. I'm going to go like, this is going to get people stop taking their drugs if you report something like that. We're going to be doing harm. And, and it just became like, and, and finally, how many editors, how many editors and reporters ended up taking the drugs themselves? Because once you move into that for a while, you're going to be a believer, right? Anyway, Long story short is that there were a lot of storytelling influences that made it difficult for critics and there was a lot of money and power and prestige behind the uh, conventional narrative. Yeah, it's, I find it really interesting. We've, there's another uh, person we've had on the channel quite a bit called Eric Weinstein, yeah. who talks about the, he, he, he's called some, he's come up with a term, the DISC, the Distributed Information Suppression Complex. And oh, I think brilliant. it, yeah, I think it fits perfectly with this. He, he basically describes how in many different areas of um, many different institutions, they coalesce around certain narratives for prestige and financial and other kind of incentive structures. And then anyone who deviates from that is like taken out. He calls it the platter of plomo. So you're either bought off or you're dispatched. It comes from the, I think, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Escobar. Used yeah. to kind of keep people in line in Medellin in Colombia by either bribery or or assassination, and he he talks about this in I think this is the, one of the the most obvious examples of how that system works that I've that I've seen. Yeah, I, I, that's uh, exactly what happened. That's a brilliant way of summarizing. Yeah, and you know and, what's brilliant about this is you can see the incentives. I mean, and you can see who benefits from this. So you can see why you, you would have this sort of uh, you know, thing in operation. That's a brilliant, I love, I love that sort of acronym too. That's a great acronym. And what, what drives you in this, in this work? What, why, why are you sort of plowing this furrow? And have you felt it a bit of a lonely battle over the years? Um, there are elements of loneliness, that's for sure. There are also uh, elements of great reward. And the reward comes from um, this counter narrative. Let's call it a counter narrative that I've been talking about. It's, it's getting more and more accepted. <laughs> it's growing, okay? And it's making inroads even into you know, journals and that sort of thing, psychiatric journals. So there is some reward uh, for pursuing a counter narrative that even as time goes by gets stronger not weaker like new evidence just continues to come along that supports your the counter narrative and, the, and and revealing the falseness of the you know of the conventional narrative. so there's something rewarding about that i've had so many 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 people write me and say ah now i understand my life i got I got screwed up on these drugs. Uh, and, and many now, so often it's hard to get off these drugs, okay? But I know many people have when they feel like they got their lives back. And of course it's rewarding to be part of a, an underdog bot battle, right? David versus Goliath, that's always fun. That said, it's tough. Because you get excommunicated, people think you're a little nutty or something. How could you, how could you be the how, how could you be the one that understands things better? You know, how can your narrative be better than uh, the narrative put together by the American Psychiatric Association? And I say, well, it's not my narrative. It's actually their narrative. It's their science. It's not my science. What's wearing though? Okay, so. And I, by the way, David, you meet so many great people, in, engaged human people, humanistic people. You also have the joy of, you know, in journalism, the old adage of like, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. 
And here you feel so often you're comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. And that's pretty great. I mean, it, it fits with sort of meaningful journalism. I think. And, you, you know, when we, we talked about the whole philosophy, I just think it's so important. It's such a big story of how it's changed our society, how we raise our kids and all that. So all that makes it meaningful. The hard part is you feel like you're making a little bit of progress. Things are getting into the psych, uh, journals, but nothing is really changing. <laughs> People still getting diagnosed left and right. People still putting on drugs left and right. Kids still being put on the drugs left and right. And so the, the weariness is, am I just banging my head on the swamp? And, and I've sort of been at this now like 20 years. <laughs> And I'm more convinced than ever that the conventional narrative is a false narrative as, as shown in their own literature. Um, if you go back to Madden America, there's sort of predictions that uh, in both of those books, okay, there's the conventional narrative, here's the counter narrative. We're gonna see which ones, what is the data that is generated in the next year is gonna show us, okay? and in, both cases, it was the counter narrative that actually played out in as new data came in. Now you might say, wow, that's pretty, uh, you know, wow, that was good predictive powers. <laughs> it wasn't. It's what the science that had been done to that time was predicting. You know what I mean? There was 40 years of, of research sort of saying, this is what's going to happen. And it was just taking that and, and, and sort of, you know, why should things change if you're, if you're just, you're still doing the same sort of thing, you're perturbing neurotransmitter systems. Anyway, it's an important battle. I think it's a battle so meaningful to people's lives. David and Goliath battles are good, but it's wearisome too. And, and you wish, it's also a little heartbreaking, you know what I mean? Like I, I, when I heard this story from this guy, uh, who, who just I, I lost my life. And I just broke up with a girl. <laughs> it's, it, you know, those, and then I'll get, you know, I'll get emails from parents who've lost their kids. And it's, it's hard, a lot of suffering. Mm. And I'd, I'd just love to, to close by returning to the piece you mentioned about the philosophy, because I think that's such an important piece of the sort of the, the, the reductionistic idea. And it reminds me a little bit of Michael Pollan's work. I don't know if you're familiar with oh, his. Yeah, sure. yeah so he did, he did a, a book called How to Change Your Mind about psychedelic therapies. Yeah, yeah. But before that, he actually, I was a huge fan of his stuff for his food work. And I think it was in defense of food. He talked about the ideology of nutritionism, like the, the, the kind of the idea that we can break all the foods down and we can understand them just through kind of vitamins and that they were, they were just effectively kind of vitamin and carb and fat delivery right. systems and he said that's that's the problem with, with with a lot of our diet with a lot of our understanding of diet because we're not we're not seeing things holistically and he said it was a, a wonderful line he said who knows what transpires in the soul of a carrot <laughs> and there's a kind of sort of natural mysticism of the or a mysticism of the natural world in his work of of like we if we tr if we start to break things apart and try to fix them um in in very reductionistic terms we're missing the essence of 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 the of the living system and it's a real problem and i see that so much in this uh in in psychiatry and in in this kind of the, the medical model of the psyche in particular i'd love to hear you just talk a little bit more about the, the philosophy aspect of it yeah um it it it, it it starts from a, a sort of mechanistic view of human beings, right? And, 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 and of course, medicine did advance in many ways from a mechanistic point of view. You know, you understood the heart and these sort of things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think medicine as a whole has faltered for that <laughs> because they're not seeing that these holistic, you know, these, we're not just a heart, we're not just this system, we're not just that system, that all these things are interrelated. I mean, we're talking physically now, right? I'm not even getting in so much into the brain. Um, but now add in the brain. 
And now adding consciousness, now this unbelievable ability to feel and know the world and, and know a little bit about your mind, at least the conscious part. I think if you go through human history, right, that we, we can, and, and people, are, societies are trying to understand themselves and they tell stories about like how we got here and what is our relationship to nature and what is the mind and God and all. There's a mystery to it. There's a profundity to it. And there's a recognition of There's a recognition of uh, sort of what you're saying here is that each of us is a mystery. We need to be humble as we try to understand each other, understand ourselves, understand our, our place in nature. And I think that philosophy, by the way, helps breed uh, a sense of responsibility to yourself, but also a sense of um, empathy towards other human beings also a sense of societies need each other. So in other words, um, out of this humility, uh, out of this holistic vision of things, um, we're not just islands, you know, we're not, we're, we're more like a bee culture, so to speak, if you understand what I mean here. In other words, we don't exist alone. We exist in, in, in eco ecological niches and societies, that sort of thing. So that's what, and that's a sort of view of life you get by reading history, reading the Bible, reading religious tracts, reading, reading novels. That's what you see, right? And now it's almost like with this mechanistic, this reductionist point of view, we lose all that. We lose that knowledge, that lore, that sense of self, that sense of society. And it's like, oh, the problem, it's in you, David. You're depressed. Yeah, something wrong with your head. It's so, it's like the most impoverished philosophy imaginable. And, it, and it's an, an impoverished philosophy that becomes a hindrance to creating a more just society, of being a more loving society, of being a more forgiving society, embracing diversity, right? Embracing people who are different. So I, I think if, if we, go back to this sense of philosophy and what's loss. The biggest loss is, it's an impoverishment of what it means to be alive. It's an impoverished philosophy. And if a person has that sense of self, it's just such a, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's like you lose yourself, if, if that makes sense. Because you're just saying, oh, this, you know, all my problems are in my head. Uh, it's some sort of chemistry. I, I just, I can't imagine if I were going to raise a kid, I can't think of any philosophy I would want them not to have. <laughs> and any sort of history, the training, learning, uh, that's exactly what I would not want them to think about. Society, themselves, others, and that sort of thing. So if, if we could have a society where we could just get rid of this narrative and sort of revisit literature, history, it would be a healthier society. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.